Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in this world. So it's Q&A with Sir Anthony, the founder of this ministry, Restoration Fellowship. If you happen to watch this live, you can type your questions in all caps in the chat. And uh, if you're watching a recording of this, we do this usually on a Friday evening here in the south of Atlanta, Georgia. And we do this once a month. Today is December the 9th, 2022. <clears throat> if you'd like to know about us, uh, this is the homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. We have many other websites. And we have a magazine, and this month's magazine is out. It's a free magazine called Focus on the Kingdom. Just click on Magazine, and then click on the particular month, year. And if you do that, you will see this, a PDF copy you can download, you can save, you can share, email, and please do so. That's why we published this now on its 20, what is it, fifth year. As you see there, top left, volume 25, signifying 25 years that Anthony has been publishing this, editing it, and this month's article only article i believe is by barbara buzzard for the love of jesus uh, from the recent human jesus conference that you can watch on our youtube channel and you can find our youtube channel on the homepage, focus on the kingdom.org and there it is youtube.com forward slash focus on the kingdom which is at our third annual jesus Human Jesus Conference, you can look at all the recordings there. <clears throat> so without further wait, here is Anthony. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Anthony. Yep, thank you for that introduction. Also by for, for the words from Gregory Boyd, I thought were very stimulating and most interesting. Yes, uh, Greg Boyd, the video, you saw one of the videos, mm -hmm. uh, obviously not a uh, Unitarian, we are biblical Unitarians. Right. Mm -hmm. He is not, but on this topic, we do agree. Greg Boyd has written extensively on the so called pacifism or nonviolent stance. Mm -hmm. And one of his books is The Myth of a Christian Nation, which yes. we recommend. But obviously, he's, he's not a biblical Unitarian or no. non Trinitarian. So, just that disclaimer there. Okay, we have questions. If you're watching live, once again, type your questions in all caps and we'll try to get to them. But first, Anthony will address questions we get during the weeks, months. Mm -hmm. And here's the first one, Anthony. Who are the great multitude in Revelation 7? Well, uh, let's look at Revelation 7 because we have a very important verse there in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. I'll refer to that to get ourselves in the right context, Revelation 7. And we have the statement in 14, the sixth angel in verse 13 sounded, and I heard a voice uh, of the four horns and the golden altar, which is before God. That's the four angels at uh, Euphrates. Actually, I'm looking at seven, the wrong verse there. 7, 14 is what I intended to read so let me turn to that correct page in my own bible here 714 question is in 13 one of the elders answered and said to me these who are clothed in the white robes who are they and where they come from and i said to him my lord you know in other words you tell me uh, john says to the angel here you tell me and the answer is very clear in verse 14 of chapter 7. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so they are before the throne of God and they will be in the future. They serve God day and night and he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. So these are the people come out of the great tribulation i think that's where the question was going am i in the right the right place there 
the great crowd are also added. Yes. Yep. Yes. Where's who the are phrase the great, great crowd, crowd or great multitude? Yep. Uh, where's that exact phrase? Which verse is that in? Uh, that verse there, seven, nine, I believe. Okay. Um, a great multitude which no one yeah, can count. It depends oh, right. on the translation. Yeah. Great yeah. multitude or mm -hmm. crowd. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they are part of this 144,000 from all the nations. From all the nations would be all the Gentiles. And the ones from the tribes of Israel, of course, are a separate, separate group. So what you've got here is Jews, we would call them Jews, if you name the tribes and you say they're from the tribe of Judah, they're the tribe of Simeon and so on, I would take that to be literally Jewish people, ethnic Jews. But then you have a great crowd also, a great multitude from every nation in verse 9. Every one of the tribes of all the world, the people's tongue standing before the throne. So you've got two classes of people here. And then the question is asked, who are these? Where did they come from? And the answer is very clear. These are people who came out of the great tribulation. Now that's a fixed item in the Bible. Jesus spoke in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 about the great tribulation. Now he's not talking about the tribulation that every Christian goes through. You'll find that mentioned in Acts 14, 22 which says we shall enter the kingdom. Finally, that's our goal, is to enter the kingdom of God when Christ comes back. And it's going to be through much tribulation that we do that. So you expect to have troubles <coughs> and difficulties in your Christian life through much tribulation. That's a general statement about trial and tribulation. But this section in Revelation 7 is about a unique time of great tribulation that lies in the future to us. It's not going on now. You cannot be living in the great tribulation now. That's impossible. So what is this great tribulation? I'll just refer to the fact that Jeremiah 30 and 31 speaks of a time of Jacob's trouble. There's going to be a very great time of extreme tribulation for the nation of Israel, what we now call Jews, and particularly in the land of Israel, there's a great time of great trouble coming. And that time is unparalleled in history. You can only have one great tribulation. You can't repeat that because it's a time that is unparalleled in history. It lies in the future just before the second coming. And Jesus referred to that in Matthew 24, 29 by saying immediately after that future great tribulation, the sun will be darkened, there'll be cosmic signs, and then they'll see Christ coming back. He's coming back to establish his kingdom worldwide, and that will mean a completely new era of world history. So you have Jews who come through that great tribulation, and you have multitudes of other nations who go through that same time, and they eventually come out of that time, and they will be finally saved when Christ returns. So that's who are the great multitude are, are. They're part of the numerous people who will be going through that future great tribulation. I stress in Matthew 24, verse 29, it says immediately after the great tribulation of those days, immediately after. So this event was not in AD 70, not at all. If it had been in AD 70, Christ would have returned then, and you know he did not. So let's be quite clear that the Great Tribulation lies in the future to us just prior to his return, and it will be immediately after. That's a verse to write down in your notes all the time, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after that time of unparalleled Great Tribulation. And in your notes, you also want to take then Daniel 12, verse 1, which solves most problems in issues of the future, uh, Daniel 12 verse 1 says, at the time, at the time of the final anti-Christian person who's called the king of the north, it says that the angel Gabriel will get up and there'll be a time at that time now, not thousands of years one way or the other, at that very time, 
of the great tribulation then following that will be immediately the resurrection of the dead so do by all means learn daniel 12 verse 1 at that time is repeated three times there at that time that should tell you then that these events are not separated by thousands of years at that time we will have the resurrection of the dead we'll have the end of the great tribulation and that end will come when Jesus intervenes to put an end to an insanity of trouble and tribulation, even worse, may I say, than we have currently. And it's pretty bad now, as Gregory Boyd was saying. And in 1 John 5, 19, you'll find the whole world lies in the power of the devil, the evil one. That's the external devil, fallen angel, whose proper name is devil. The devil, that's the proper name of a person and the whole world. So Gregory Boyd is absolutely right when he says you cannot have a Christian nation now by definition. Every nation is part of the evil system dominated by the devil, as in 1 John 5.19. He's the god of this world. Your job as a Christian is to come out and be separate from that world system not to fight its battles, not to kill and murder other people and other Christians, that would be unthinkable. So come out from that world system and then perhaps you will not be needing to go through the great tribulation because if you have been tried and tested enough before and you've been proven right and strong, then you won't go through the great future tribulation. But if you're needing to be tested, if necessary to the point of death, then your lot will go to be uh, will be to go through that great tribulation, either as a Jew of the twelve tribes, or as a great multitude of Gentiles. Those who come out and through that great tribulation successfully will have proven themselves fit to inherit the kingdom of God, and that's the biblical language. Nobody goes to heaven when you die in the Bible. That's a completely foreign idea. Your goal and destiny as a Christian is to inherit the kingdom of God, the kingdom of David, in fact, restored at the end of this age. That's what we're praying for when we say, may your kingdom come. Okay, I'll leave it at that, Carlos. So, yeah, the um, a related question to this. Mm. So the, the crowd, uh, yes. the huge crowd or multitude, people mm -hmm. from every nation. Yes. Um, so the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, uh, mm. speak about survivors from the nations. Absolutely. So you have Isaiah 2, Micah 4, and the those other prophecies. Mm -hmm. So are these the survivors from the nations? Are these the ones we can connect to the great crowd or great multitude? Well, these people, the people in Revelation 7 verse 14 are expressly people who will have gone through that final time of unprecedented tribulation. And they'll be from the Jewish tribes and also as Gentiles, non-Jews. So, yes, yeah, some of those will survive into the kingdom of God, having been tested and tried. And then uh, that doesn't mean that only the people in the Great Tribulation will be in the kingdom. There will be people resurrected from all the ages in the past. You know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will be resurrected to life in order to inherit the kingdom. And among those many people, of course, will be either the great crowd or the 144,000 who will have gone through that tribulation and proven themselves just prior to the return of Christ. All right, um, next mm. question here. What verse says mm. Jesus was created? <laughs> well, if you say that Jesus was begotten, as the Bible clearly does, you're saying he was created because to beget means in English even, and certainly in Greek, it means to procreate. It means to bring into existence. So once you know that Jesus was procreated, and the two verses I would give you right away would be Luke one thirty five, where the miracle effected by God supernaturally in the womb of his mother Mary, it is said that that miracle makes Jesus the son of God. So if you want to know why, how is Jesus the son of God? 
Luke 135 has the exact answer you need. He was pro procreated in the womb of his mother. You can't be human unless you begin in the womb of your mother. You cannot be human if you're older than your own mother or older than your own father. That's just impossible. The Bible is not that difficult. So the answer is quite clearly the procreation, the begetting of Jesus was in Luke 135, where Luke precisely says this. It's precisely because of the miracle that Jesus is the Son of God. And the other verse you need in your notes would be Matthew 120, where Matthew said, what is begotten, procreated, that is, in her, in her, in Mary, in her womb, is from God. It's a sheer miracle. So Jesus has no human father, has a human mother, of course. Adam, of course, had no human father either. So this is a unique son. Jesus is a human being, the beginning of a new type of human being, initiated by his procreation, his begetting, which means coming into existence. So that's creation. That's not very difficult. Messiah has to be human to qualify. So if you believe in a Messiah who is not human, if you think he's really there from eternity along with God the Father, you don't have the right Messiah. You need to read 135 of Luke, Matthew 120, and see that the miracle was that God created, procreated, brought into existence a unique human being, not just an ordinary man, absolutely not. How many men do you know don't have human fathers? The answer is none. So this is an exceptional man. But if he's not man, if he's really God dressed up as man, then you have the wrong Jesus. That's simply a fact. Just on, um, just on that Matthew 120 you mentioned, yeah. Anthony. Mm. So we have Luke 135. Yes. Uh, Matthew 120, uh, verses mm -hmm. that show Jesus was created. Absolutely. On, on Matthew 120, as you can see there from the translations, mm -hmm. they have the child in Mary yes. conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. Uh, so most translations uh, invariably have for the Greek there the word yes. conceived. Yes. Um, so why are you saying this verse yes. is... is uh, Actually, the literal standard version yes. has begotten. That's correct. So why are these translations, mm -hmm. most of them, not showing that procreated yeah. word, which is the old antiquated? Well, because, uh, how would, uh, yeah, it's a great question. I would say that's a form of crime scene. They're trying to hide from you the fact that that's a begetting there. So that literal standard version and the other one that you had up there also is correctly translated. It doesn't say conceived there. Now, it was a conception, that's true. But this is the activity of a father. It's the father who begets and the mother who conceives. The translations, many of them are hiding from you a stupendous truth, namely that Jesus was fathered, procreated in the womb of Mary, his mother. That's a miracle. So I'm glad you pointed out that very fact there. Yen so, yeah, so tell us about that word uh, translated conceived. Is that wrong yeah. then? Well, it's misleading because it's not just a conception. It's a coming into existence, a begetting. Yenithen is from yenao, which is the word I was referring to earlier about being begotten. It means to father. It's what the father does. And we know that the woman conceives, that's certainly true. But there it is, yenao, it means to beget, to procreate. And expressly in Matthew 120, this is the activity of the father, creating, procreating, fathering, begetting, bringing into existing, into existence, procreating the one who is Jesus, the Messiah. That's the miracle of his virginal begetting, I would call it. Let's start calling it a virginal begetting. It's a miracle. So those translations are hiding in a, a, a not too unobvious way, 
And right. the Greek word there is quite clear. That means, and you had some translations out that, that had it right there, didn't you? Right. So the root, uh, yeah. the root word is if you yenao. go to Bayer's, yes, is yenao. Of course. And I highlighted there one of the yes. uh, Bayer's Greek lexicon properly mm. of men begetting children. Good. And I think it uh, helps to say procreated because yes. the English word beget or begotten is really antiquated. No one really yes. says that in common no, that's English exactly right. today. Right. So basically here, yes. uh, Matthew is telling us that the child yes. in Mary is a procreation yes. by the power of God's spirit. Exactly. And of interest is a couple of verses earlier in 18. Mm -hmm. That's why Matthew says, the genesis, yes, not just birth or beginning, but the origin, origin exactly. of Jesus. So mm -hmm. that ties into that, I guess. Oh, absolutely, it does. Yes, if anybody is thinking about the Trinity, they should realize that you will find no Trinity in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. People try to find it in John, but you might ask yourself, why, if the Trinity is so important to people, why did Matthew not have a word to say that about that? Why did Luke say nothing at all about a triune God? So that should get people thinking, what is the truth here? Go back to those good verses about the genesis of Jesus. Go back to those two verses, Matthew 120, Luke 135. And there you've got the beginning of this unique human person who is the Messiah. And he's the right. only true Messiah. So according to... Uh, Matthew, yes, uh, he uses the word Genesis twice, yes. Yes, by the does. way, in mm. chapter one, yes, the beginning of his uh, account, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's the word Genesis too, good, which is once again hiding in the translations because most translations have birth, yes, yes, well, it's do. not a birth and it's not no. uh, a beginning as such, no. but it's origin. Origin, I mean, indeed. this word is very popular from the first book of the Bible, of course, yes. Genesis. Yes. yes. And in the Greek translation, it's interesting that the um, the family tree of Adam, I, I believe. Yes. Yes. The same word is used, I think, in Genesis right. three or four of or something. Course. It says the yes. Genesis. In in other words, this is the origin of the lineage of yes. Adam, and yes. then it gives the the son. So. So if this is true, mm. and it looks like it is from the text, <laughs> yeah. uh, what does this do, Anthony, to the uh, so-called eternal generation of the Son? Well, the eternal generation is actually a contradiction in terms. To be eternally generated would mean that you have no beginning. You would have no beginning. And if you have no beginning, you haven't begun. You've never even got off the ground. There is no Christ at all. So it's highly dangerous to speak about a son who was eternally brought into existence. That would mean he never really came into existence. He was always being brought into existence, but it really never happened. So that's just a very confusing thing derived from the church fathers who around the third and fourth centuries developed a whole new concept by which they turned the Son of God, the one that we're looking at here, the one procreated, the one beginning to exist in Mary, they turned him into an eternal, eternally begotten, which is absolutely not something that preachers preach on because it's confusing for them. And the public normally doesn't ask its pastor to preach on these great issues. And so the information is not out there, but we've given it to you this evening I always check that carefully. Matthew one twenty and Luke one thirty five. All right, thank yeah. you. We mm -hmm. will go to a live question here. If you okay. have any questions watching okay. live, please type them in all caps. We will try to get to your live questions. Mm -hmm. We also have other questions uh, we mm -hmm. get through the weeks. Mm -hmm. So let's do a live one now because yes. there's a, a whole bunch uh, piling mm -hmm. up. Uh, can you divorce and remarry? <laughs> well, the answer to that is that Paul allows for divorce of a married couple 
if that person becomes an unbeliever, you'll find that in 1 Corinthians. So the answer is that Christians married to each other have no right to divorce because you took a vow before God to remain together for life. So if you were to have sexual activity with people outside your marriage, you'd be committing adultery, which if not repented is a fatal sin. That's very clear. However, if the situation would arrive that your mate is an, either an unbeliever or becomes an unbeliever, she gives up the faith, then you would have a right to remarriage if she leaves you. In other words, you can do nothing about it. She's, an, she's become an unbeliever, doesn't believe anymore, or she was never a believer. You shouldn't, of course, have married her in the first place as an unbeliever, but suppose you did, then you're going to have to face a situation that she might leave you, in which case Paul, I think, would allow you a second marriage because that marriage has been annulled because of the mate's unfaithfulness, unrepented. And so in that case, then you would have a right to remarriage. So each question, each situation would have to be examined on its own merits. I hope that yeah. helps. Let, mm -hmm. let me read some of that passage there. So this is 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, to the rest of you, I, not the Lord, say, if a believing man has an unbelieving wife and she is content to live with him, he is not to divorce her. If a woman has an unbelieving husband, he is content to live with her, he should not divorce her. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, the unbelieving wife made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unholy, but as it is, they are holy. Yet, here's the clause, a qualification, if the unbeliever leaves, let it happen, the brother or sister is not bound, in other words, bound in marriage. I think so, yes. Uh, in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Yes, that's, a, I think, very clear. Not bound, I take to mean not bound by that marriage. Therefore, free to marry, because you're no longer married under that situation. It's yeah, that you've responded yeah if you're not married, you're single. <laughs> that's what it's, I would argue from there. Simple, uh, yes. As that. All yes. right, we'll go to another mm -hmm. live one here. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, let me get the screen off. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the best French language theological works that come to mind for you? Oh, my goodness. French language theological works. I don't know offhand, I'd have to look at my library of 5,000 books or so close by. Um, there is a man by the name of Lagrange, L-A-G-R-A-N-G-E, -E, who writes on Jewish eschatology, Lagrange. Uh, he does very well. There are other French scholars and particularly German scholars who are extremely good, but I would have to have notice of that uh, question a bit longer to give you a number of names. I don't know. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So we'll go to one of the questions we mm. get during the week. Oh, yes. Why is Jesus called God with us, Emmanuel? And that's yes. Matthew 1 23. Yes. Well, that's not difficult at all. That's a quotation from Isaiah, and the Messiah there is called Immanuel, which means God is with us. That doesn't mean the person is God, and I'll tell you why. In Proverbs 30, there's a lady who had a child, and she called that child Ithiel. It's in Proverbs 30, verse 1. She called that child Ithiel, I-T-H-I-E-L, which means God is with me. She didn't think the child was God. So when the Messiah is called Emmanuel, God is with us or God with us, it's what's happening in that child that's being described. If you are with Jesus, then you are automatically with the God of Jesus, who is the one God of the Bible. And that God is certainly with us 
in the person of Jesus. That doesn't make the person God any more than Ithiel means that the person was God. So that's a very good parallel there. Oh, so better. these are what's known as theophoric names. And yes. you have the shortened form of the divine name, Yah, yes. Yes. sometimes J J A H or yes. Y-A-H. Yes. And a very popular one is Elijah, for example. Yes. yes. So that, that actually is a compound. Yes. L. Yes. The, the singular God and Yahweh. Yes. So you have God Yahweh, but obviously that did not right. mean the prophet was no, the no. God Jehovah. No. This is not All right, difficult. Let's, not let's difficult. go to the mm. other question yes, here. Yes, certainly. What do you got? Um, if God created all things because of mm. or with his son in mind, yes. why didn't Paul use the Greek preposition mm. dia, yes. which means through, in the <laughs> accusative, yeah. which means that, because of? Well, what if Paul used another phrase which means the same thing? We can't dictate to Paul, you know, exactly what words he uses. So you'll find in Colossians chapter 1 that Paul said, all things were created in Jesus. The world there is N, E-N, in Jesus. And the standard commentaries say that word doesn't mean by. It doesn't say everything was created by Jesus. That would be quite wrong. It says that everything was created in Jesus. That's causal, because of Jesus. And whether you write the with the accusative, which means because of, or whether you write N, as in that case, it makes no difference at all. So Paul certainly said that everything was created because of Jesus. And that's what the Expositor's New Testament actually says. It plainly says there, this doesn't mean by Jesus, because that wouldn't allow Jesus to be human. You cannot be human if you were there creating the world in Genesis. That would destroy your humanity and would introduce another Jesus, and we don't want to do that. So he does say because of, but using the causal N in Colossians 1, verse 16. Okay. All righty, we'll go to the next question. Okay. Uh, we, let's see, can we sin against the Holy Spirit yeah. without knowing it? Uh, yeah, I, that would depend on individual cases. Sin against the Holy Spirit is where, in the Gospels, they saw an absolute miracle happen in front of them, and they accused Jesus of working through the power of the devil. I don't think it's likely that you can be in that situation today. You are not watching Jesus uh, perform extraordinary miracles in front of your eyes. You're not seeing that. We don't have apostles with a capital A now, because to be an apostle with a capital A, you have to have seen Jesus alive, and you have to have the accrediting signs of an apostle. We don't have that today. So committing the unpardonable sin, I assume, would be harder today than it would in the time of Jesus. However, the fact remains that in Hebrews chapter 10, which is the starkest and most uh, alarming passage of Scripture that one knows about, it is possible to throw away your salvation if you deliberately say, I'm going to do what I know is wrong. I don't care about God or his truth anymore. Then you would come near to committing the unpardonable sin. But only God can judge that. You and I cannot. But the unpardonable sin is where you deliberately, knowingly, throw away the truth that you've learned. And Hebrews 10 would give you the most uh, stark and clear example of that. So I would leave it at that point. Unlikely, I think, if you really think you might have committed the unpardonable sin, it probably means you haven't because you're nervous about that and you get on your knees and beg God for forgiveness. And remember then that only a deliberate calling of God's spirit, something evil in plain sight, that would be what the Bible calls the unpardonable sin. All right. And 
Let's see. We'll go to another live question. Mm -hmm. Should we give to persons who are able to work but choose not to because of laziness? <laughs> no, I wouldn't do it. No, why not? I mean, you're supporting their evil. Everybody should be able to work if they're in good enough health to work. Everybody should be earning a living to support their, their uh, family, of course. So if you're going to just cause them to continue to be lazy, you're abetting, aiding and abetting their laziness. No, I don't see the point of that. You're helping them to go on sinning. You should very gently and kindly try to point out to them that working is what people have to do. Every man should have a job and support his family. So my answer to that would be, don't give in such a way that it helps people to go on sinning. Otherwise, you might be guilty of that sin yourself, and I wouldn't recommend that. Why does Jude 5, uh, which is also visible in the Greek and early manuscripts mm -hmm. in Greek, say that Jesus saved his people from Egypt? And Exodus 14, verse 30 <clears throat> says the same thing. Mm -hmm. It says, does the Lord save Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians? Mm -hmm. So it's the Lord oh. Yahweh. Oh, yes. I don't see Jesus there, so. No, there's nothing about Jesus there. Yahweh is the tetragrammaton, the famous four-letter word, yod he vav -he, which means the one God of Israel, the one God of Jesus. So what about the other one in Jude? I wouldn't accept that as a genuine text at all. It's ridiculous to say that Jesus, who wasn't even alive, could have saved anybody from Egypt. He didn't. So that's just a false text, and there are false verses, and you can look at the relevant material and see that most modern translations do not have the word Jesus there because they think it's highly improbable, and I would agree with them. Just avoid the word Jesus there in Hebrews. It's wrong. Okay. Uh, yep, just trying to bring up yeah. different translations here. Yes. Good, so you. the the short yeah. answer hmm. is that it's a manuscript issue. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the best scholars. Yes. Or the, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to get a consensus. It's like yes. rabbis, but yes, <laughs> I think the best as on scholarship here concedes that it's either the Lord or God. Yes. Who uh, saved them? So you have yes, even yes. the NIV, the nearly inspired. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Lord at one time delivered. Yes. His people out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So to have Jesus there also, Anthony, would uh, be a, a bit of a problem because obviously Jesus did yes. not exist in the Old no. Testament. No. no. Uh, you know, no one talks about Jesus in the Old Testament. So No, no, no. That's absolutely, it makes him non-human. And we went through a few minutes ago, the origin, the beginning, the begetting, the procreation of Jesus, which happened in the womb of his mother long before the children were brought out of Egypt. So that's just impossible. You cannot use one verse to contradict 99% of the evidence. That just isn't good common sense at any level. Uh, Psalm 45 is the one that's being quoted there. So if we look at Psalm 45, we'll have... Uh, a, an easy answer to that question. Psalm 45, we have uh, this famous statement in verse 6, your throne, O God, this is a reference to Messiah here. It's the sons of men and the king who is Messiah, son of men. You are the fairest of the human race. Grace is poured on your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. This is the Messiah. God, Messiah has a God. God, the one God, has blessed you forever. Then, this is a messianic package, uh, passage about what Messiah is going to do. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and your majesty. Ride on victoriously. This is a prayer that Jesus will conquer his enemies at the second coming. For the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness, let your right hand, which is the symbol of your strength, your right hand, your arrows are sharp. Peoples fall under you, your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. Still talking about the Messiah. Your throne, O God, 
is forever and ever. It's a very unusual use of the word God addressed to the Messiah here. And you'll find that the idea that you'd have two gods is completely ruled out immediately. So lest you should imagine that there are now two gods, we read in six, second half of verse six, a scepter of uprightness is, a scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You, addressing this Messiah God here, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Now here's the possible correction. Therefore, God, who is your God. Okay, so this God has a God. That's clear. Therefore, he cannot be the ultimate God. So all this is, is a very unusual and rare messianic use of the word Elohim to describe Jesus, who is uniquely, as we said earlier, the uh, representative of God. So the key then is in verse 7, God, who is your God. And sometimes then the translation, the NAB, I believe it is, the Catholic Bible rightly puts a small g on the first one in six. Your throne, O God, little g. And they have a note to the effect that this is a messianic title for Jesus, who himself has a God, as in the book of Revelation multiple times, Jesus is said to have a God. Therefore, he cannot be God. God doesn't have a God. The ultimate one God, the God of the creed of Jesus in Mark 12, 29. Ask any of your Jewish friends, what does it mean? It's a Unitarian creed. Everybody could know that the creed of Judaism is always Unitary monotheism. Jews never believe that God is more than one person. That would be the ultimate crime against God. And Jesus was a Jew agreeing with a friendly Jew in Mark 12. Friendly Jew said, tell us what's the greatest of all the commandments. Most people, if you ask them, will say, well, it's love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second commandment. But what about the first commandment? Listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. How many lords is one Lord? So that's now touching base with the original Bible, which is not a Trinitarian book at all. It's a Jewish book. And Jesus himself, whom we are to, to follow and follow his teachings, we're to obey him by doing what he says, we ought to be paying close attention to Mark 12, 29, where Jesus gave us the first unmatched commandment of all, which is the Lord our God is one single Lord. I hope that will be of interest to you. Yeah, if, uh, what's unfortunate about Mm -hmm. the uh, psalm 45 mm. from where hebrews 1 is citing yes is the translations are confusing to say the least because they render as you see there invariably yeah. the title god uh, the word god is a title by the way mm. uh angels are called gods uh the judges mm -hmm. of israel are called god mm -hmm. Uh, Moses famously called God at least twice, Exodus 4, yeah. Exodus 7. So it's a title. Mm -hmm. And um, what's unfortunate is when it's applied to the Davidic king here in Psalm 45, mm -hmm. they capitalize the word yeah. God. Yes. Something they do not do, translators, when it comes to Moses, the right. affirmation angels. Right. So it's confusing because, as you said, mm -hmm. Uh, the writer goes on to identify another capital G God. Yes, yes. Well, that that now sounds like uh, polytheism. It does. Well, it would now be. Now you got two capital G gods, yes. don't you? Well, of course you have, and that is polytheism. And your translations there, you don't have access, I think, on screen to the <clears throat> Jerusalem Bible. The Roman Catholic Bible, which often does very much better than some of the Protestant uh, paraphrases. So the NAB, the New American Bible, which is the Roman Catholic translation, you find that it has a lowercase g when referred to Jesus there, which is very smart. Some good scholars amongst those people. Yeah, uh, you have to dig for it. Uh, the NAB, yeah. the New American... Yes. 
Bible, mm -hmm. uh, they actually changed back to capital G God in their latest oh, no. uh, uh, iteration. <laughs> I think the 1990-something yes. right. is the mm -hmm. only one that has lower lowercase. Yes. So let me give, uh, if yeah. I may, Anthony, an yeah, example of, course. of, of what course. we mean. So let's go to Exodus 4.16, mm. and I'll mm. show you what... what uh, uh, actually, no, not yes. Exodus 4.16. Um, 7.1 and 4.16. Uh, is it 7.1? Mm -hmm. yep. No, you're like, God, they do capitalize oh. it. Okay, that's a bad example. They do okay. capitalize it because uh, Moses is compared to the one God. So, yes. yeah, that's a, a bad example. But if you see uh, the judges yeah. of Israel who right. are called God, mm -hmm. uh, for example, actually, let's go to John 10. Yes. Uh, where Jesus himself uh, cites from Psalm. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, let's just go to the Psalm. Psalm 82. Yes. Famously calls uh, the judges there humans, yes. gods. Yes. There you are. Uh, let's see. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, I'm trying to look. I thought, all oh, right, gods. So yes. that's a good example of what I'm, what I'm talking about. Yes. So typically it's lowercase g for others, like yes. the judges. Yes. Uh, the Moses one is different, I forgot, because he's being compared to the, the God, the one God, capital G. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of bias that um, that confuses people. Yes. Uh, when it comes to the Messianic King. So I yeah. think it's fair to say. Absolutely. It's a secondary use of the word God. It's a small g would be appropriate. And as you said, some of the translations, particularly the Roman Catholic translation in its earlier form, has a lowercase g in that Psalm 45 to, to distinguish between a lowercase God, the Messiah, <coughs> Just right. remember that 1,300 times in the New Testament alone, 1,300 times, the word God means the Father. This isn't very difficult. You don't then say, well, I've got one verse here which contradicts 1,300. That's not a good way to go about evidence. Don't make the exceptions into the rules. Take the vast majority of cases, 1,300 times, thousands of times in the Bible, God is designated by singular personal pronouns. He's I, I am the Lord your God. There's no one else except me. I alone am God, no one else is God except me. Now, if I were to say that about myself, you'd have no difficulty understanding. But we unfortunately go to church with a whole set of traditions which don't date from the Bible. The unfortunate thing is we say, well, I believe in the Bible only, sola scriptura. Well, you don't actually because you haven't bothered to check to see that what you're getting in church is really in the Bible or is it a man-made tradition? That's the challenge. All right, uh, we'll go to a live question here. Okay. Um, Christ is the son of the living God only. He is not God incarnate. If right. Jesus came in Father's name, that does not make him God, right? That's exactly right. He's coming as God's representative. He's the son of God. The son of God cannot be God. No son is equal to his father. But Jesus is unique. He's not just a man, not a mere man. He's a man without a human father. He was brought into existence, as we went through in an earlier question, in the womb of his mother. Therefore, he is human. But he's uniquely human. He's the uniquely begotten, procreated son. And he comes then representing the father. He keeps saying, I am uniquely speaking for my father. The words that I'm speaking to you, Jesus keeps saying, are my father's words. I didn't make these up. I'm uniquely obedient to my father. What he says and thinks, I'm saying and thinking. So I'm a human being, Jesus keeps saying who is in an unparalleled way, like the one God, speaking as the agent, the plenipotentiary, to use a long word, 
of the one God who is the Father. Check with your Jewish friends. The Bible was given to Jews. You know that they have the oracles of God, as Paul said. What advantage, Paul asked there in Romans, is it to be a Jew? Much in every way, Paul said, to the Jewish people were entrusted the oracles of God, the Bible. So I would give up talking about the Old Testament. You're misleading yourself. It's not the Old Testament. It's the first almost three quarters of your Bible, two thirds of your Bible, which is the Hebrew Bible. If you misunderstand all of it, two thirds of your Bible, you're certainly going to misunderstand the last quarter of your Bible, which we call the New Testament. So talk about the Hebrew Bible. When Jesus explained everything about himself, he started at the law and the prophets and the writings. It's a Jewish book. Jesus was not an American. The Bible is not an American or British book. So please do the Bible the honor of taking it as a unique revelation, first given to Jews, and Jesus himself was a Jew. No room for anti-Semitism here at all. All right, we have a question about mm. Genesis 6. Oh, yes. and just to add, uh, yeah. actually, before yes, we please. go there, yes. just to add to that um, mm -hmm. question about he comes in the Father's name. Yes, yes. So in Matthew 21, we have the famous triumphal entry. The last time he goes into Jerusalem and the crowds are now accepting him, accepting him as a, a true prophet of God. And not just that, many are accepting him as the Messiah. And we see there in, what is it, verse 9, now the crowds going ahead of Jesus, those who followed him, were shouting Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes. So that's something interesting that the crowd understood who he was. Yes. Uh, you wouldn't say that about God himself, would you? <laughs> no, hardly. Have you got the Mark version of that one in Mark 10? It's even better because it speaks about the coming kingdom, the, the equivalent in Mark chapter 10 what did they say here blessed be the coming kingdom of our father david it doesn't get any more jewish than that um uh, do you know what verse uh, mark 10 verse 11 try and go back to 11. um uh, 11 11 mark 10 Oh, right. that one. oh, Mark 11, 10. Let's go backwards. Yep, 11, there 10. There it is. Yes, 11, 10. I got it backwards. 11, 10. Hosanna, which means save us. Blessed he is he, the Messiah, who comes as the representative of the one Lord God. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. So with great respect to Gregory Boyd, the idea of having a king is absolutely right. I grant that they asked for a king, but God granted them a king. And according to the Bible, David was a man after God's own heart. God had a special love for David, and he was the symbol of the King Jesus. So remember that Messiah means king. It's a royal book. Jesus is the ultimate David. The whole Bible is about being in Jerusalem with the kingdom of God established and Jesus sitting on the throne of his father David restored in Jerusalem and your destiny, which is not well known in the churches at all, is not to play a harp on a pink cloud in the sky. That's completely foreign. Your destiny is to rule with royal authority alongside Jesus. So if you're a Christian, you've been selected, you've been elected to train now to be the government of that future worldwide government that will not begin until Jesus comes back, namely the blessed kingdom of our father, David. That's the story. Ask your preacher to preach on that week after week, and you'll get the gist of this very Jewish book, which we call the Bible. Yeah, just to follow up, Anthony, on mm. coming in the name of the father, yes. in First Samuel 17, mm -hmm. There's a good parallel to the son of David, to David himself, 
when he famously fights against Goliath and then the Philistines, as you see here. So 1 Samuel 17, um, the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And they said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild animals. Wow, quite a threat. But then David says to them, you come to me with a sword, a spear, a saber, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And so you see there that usage, Anthony, of to come yes. in the name of the Lord. Yes. Obviously, it does not mean you are that same no, Lord Yahweh, does it? <laughs> not at all. The name means all you are and stand for. All of your character, your identity, everything you are and everything you say, that's the name. Now, for name in our language is not that. A name is more of a label. But in the Bible, if you come in the name of God, you're coming exercising as a representative, as an agent, everything that God is, everything that God stands for. That's what's meant by name. Hence, in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name, means may everything you stand for, everything you are, your whole character, may that be treated as very sacred and holy. So what have we done? We've used it very largely as a swear word. We have a long way, as Gregory Boyd, I'm sure, would agree, before we get back to something like a biblical standard of holiness. All right. Thanks, mm. Anthony, for yeah. your time tonight. We'll oh, leave it there. It. Yeah, okay. And thanks, everyone out there, for uh, watching. Before we leave, some, uh, let's see, some announcements of what we have in store this coming week. Let's see. So there is a debate coming up. Yes, another debate. So this will take place this Tuesday, December 13. I'll put the link in the chat. So I'm debating for the second time, uh, Mr. Samuel Nason. He's a, he's a man out of Malaysia. And he, uh, let's see, he has a ministry. You can find out about him, I think, in the description. Uh, yep. So he's president of Explain International and Apologetics Ministry that operates out of Malaysia, as it says there, and other countries. So I'm thankful to him for doing another debate on this important topic, which is, uh, I just hit the, did Jesus have two natures? As some of you know, the um, Catholic Protestant teaching since the fifth century AD or so, the so-called double nature of Christ or the hypostatic union, is that biblical? Is Jesus the so-called God-man? Did he have two natures, as they say, existing at the same time while he was on earth? So we will debate that next Tuesday. And uh, it will be moderated, by the way, by Tracy from Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions. And I'd like to thank her once again of head of time so all right meet us back here next month god willing in the new year so this is the last q a of 2020 what are we two wow so we're headed 23 wow and still waiting for the lord so god bless everyone until we meet again